Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV. What you're about to experience is a free, worldwide, interactive broadcast from Ontario, Canada. We broadcast live every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Get your questions in. Join the community chat room at www.category5.tv or email us at live at category5.tv. And now, let's begin. Here's your host, Robbie Ferguson. Welcome to episode number 195 of Category 5 Technology TV. Nice to see you. Great to have everybody here. I'm Robbie Ferguson. I'm Krista Wells. And tonight we are going to be covering a whole bunch of stuff. We've got some viewer questions that have come in this week. Uh, and you can email your questions to Krista live at category5.tv. Also, we're going to be uh, covering part two of our video production series, which you'll find out uh, or you'll be able to uh, look at at cat5.tv slash vidprod. We'll talk more about that. But tonight, we're going to scale some clips using OpenShot Video Editor. Uh, also, stick around. We're going to be looking for desktop alternatives uh, for the new Ubuntu 11.04. If you've been hung up on the fact that uh, you just can't get used to Unity, we're going to give you some alternatives tonight. So stick around. Uh, also, coming up in the newsroom, we've got Hillary who's joining us. Hi, Hill. <laughs> And tonight, Hillary is going to be talking to us about uh, the decision at the Supreme Court. Uh, you remember Eye for Eye was here in the studio, uh, or actually was uh, visiting us v uh, via Skype video uh, a little while back, and uh, we finally have the Supreme Court ruling, and Hillary is going to be telling us all about that in just a little bit. Also, uh, there has been some chaos with RSA and Secure ID, and uh, you may or may not have heard they're another uh, company that have come under hacker attack and they have revealed some information about what has been exposed as far as what uh, their client data. Uh, so stick around. And also, uh, Facebook, they know what you look like, and they are perfectly willing to share that information with pretty much anybody. So we're going to hear from Hillary and find out uh, what she has to say about all those things coming up in about 30 minutes' time. In the meantime, get into the chat room, category5.tv. And of course, if you're on Freenode, if you're using an IRC client or Pigeon or anything that will connect you to uh, irc.freenode.net, join us in Category 5. Greetings to the chat room. Hey, everybody. And how's your week going? Oh, good so far. Yeah. Still early. <laughs> Every Tuesday. Good so far. You never know. I've got to leave a little room for air. And, and, uh, yeah. 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 How about you? Busy? Yeah, it's been busy. Um, we, as you know, we're hit by a power surge a few weeks. Well, I guess it's it's probably been a little bit more than that now. I'm, I didn't jot down the date that mm -hmm. it happened, but um, we've we've had two storms that seem to take out a whole bunch of hardware ar around Barry. And and uh, the first storm, we lost our main broadcast system as well as a couple of miscellaneous things like some microphones and even the water cooler in the kitchen. <laughs> like, just miscellaneous things, right? Then this most recent storm, which hit on Wednesday, it took out one of our UPSs. Fortunately, no other computer hardware seems to have been affected, mm -hmm. but we had a UPS, a thousand volt amp UPS that is completely shot. We took it in and they said they can't even, they, they won't even fix it, it needs to be replaced. So, um, so that, that's not the worst of it. We've had like server after server after server of customer servers that have gone down because of the uh, the storms. Hard drives that have crashed. Uh, and somebody with a, a Mac computer who got hit by the storm. But only one, right? Only one Mac computer it's was because susceptible. Because ratio-wise, <laughs> there is only one. Yeah. Well, no. <laughs> it wasn't mine. So. No, it wasn't yours. It's okay. But uh, lots and lots of hard drives that are crashing. And if there's anything that I've learned uh, or that I've tried to uh, teach to people as they come in with their crashed hard drives, especially, you know, guys who have got, they've gone out and bought an external backup hard drive <laughs> and they're connecting it to their computer and they just use it like extra storage. Yeah. And you're saving your images and your pictures and your videos directly onto that. Uh, one gentleman, unfortunately, and it's a sad case, it's not something to laugh about at all, just didn't know any better and was using a, a data backup drive like that. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't redundant. It was his only copy, and because it was his only copy, he thought it was a good idea to take it everywhere he went. Oh, no. And, of course, <laughs> the drive ended up getting dropped. And this yeah. is just in the past week. Like, these are the things that I'm, I'm dealing with, or, or that the staff that I work with are dealing with. And uh, it's just an, an eye-opener. So if you're, if you're using a data, like an external backup drive, as an individual point of failure, if you're saving your data to that, and you're not saving it somewhere else at the same time, I would encourage encourage you 
uh, to reassess your, your setup and, and make sure that you always have at least two copies of your critical data. And preferably, uh, one of those would be distant from the other, uh, whether it be off-site data backup or whether you be you know, taking it to, to work with you or something like that or, mm -hmm. or using a pogo plug to upload it to a family member's house, something along those lines. Always good to have something in place so there's redundancy. So that's what I've been up mm -hmm. against this week. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That busy, eh? Yeah, it's been busy. It's been good, though. <laughs> On our website, uh, if you go over to category5.tv, I'm very encouraged. As I talk about you know power surges and, and the hardware that we've, uh, that we've lost here at Category 5, I'm, I'm greatly encouraged to see that our viewers are once again standing by us. We've got our, our needs are... Not not exceptional as far as they go. I mean, the the workstation that we're able to get is is only going to cost five hundred dollars, and uh, we're we're trying to be as frugal as possible and get the best deal that we possibly can. But you'll see that we're we're up at sixty four percent. We've had uh, a fair number of donations that have come in this week, uh, jumping up from I think it was forty forty seven or so last week. Um, so we're at sixty four percent right now towards our goal to replacing the hardware that was damaged or or. Uh, that needs replacing from from the power surge, uh, and that's not taking into account the UPS that we just found out about. That's not on the list, and and I think I'm I'm just gonna figure. You know, we'll just have to buy another <laughs> UPS at some point. It's just inevitable. So, but uh, but thank you to everybody who's shown support and who's continuing to show support for Category Five. A couple of people have actually subscribed to a monthly donation as well, and uh, that's certainly very appreciated. It, uh, it, it helps to know that there's a, a regular consistent uh, amount that is going to be donated, and, and that helps to pay the bills, and usually those ones go directly towards hosting and things like that. So uh, we appreciate every, every, little, every little donation and every uh, larger donation as well uh, that comes into the show. Everything adds up, and it makes a huge difference, as you can see, 64% towards, towards that. So. Viewer points this week. I did. Uh, I did receive one picture. Yay! Yay! <laughs> one picture. It better be a good one. It better be a good one. Let's see here. Mm -hmm. All right. Viewer pictures for episode number one ninety five. I've got one here from John Gallagher, who joins us via Miro Internet TV uh, from Glasgow. And it's uh, it's nice to have you joining us. And there he is, uh, watching Category Five, up on the TV. And uh, very nice to have you here, and thank you for sending in your picture, John. So we will uh, we will attribute a hundred mm -hmm. viewer bonus points on his account. I say I like that we're uh, we're up beside the window there. You get some fresh air. Yeah, I, nice. I'm kind of. I like the window seat. That's good. <laughs> very good. I'm just saying. Just saying. Just saying. I like that it's uh, it's on a TV. It's comfy, casual. It's. You can sit mm -hmm. and, and just enjoy the show and kick back. And uh, watching on Miro Internet TV, um, John can certainly send us email live at category5.tv uh, because Miro, of course, is pre-recorded uh, as opposed to the live show. But if you're watching live, it's it's neat because you can get uh, you can be very interactive with the show. Uh, first half of the show, we we always uh, address your questions as best we can in the chat room. And uh, speaking of questions, I'm sure we've got some that uh, they're coming up. Thanks again, John, and I will uh, throw some points on your on your profile and if you would like to get some viewer points just bonus viewer points just send us a picture of you uh, watching category 5 TV on your device doesn't matter what device it is even if it's a little tiny thing like this snap Watch a picture it. yeah cool. 100 viewer points you never know when we're gonna say hey trade in 100 viewer points and we'll give you this a cookie a cookie or <laughs> a browser cookie <laughs> Either way. Yeah, either oh, way. before we get into the serious questions, mm -hmm. there's a quick question here in the chat room from El Ket. He says, where is Eric? Eric? Is this a silly question? <laughs> what do you mean <laughs> before we get into the serious questions? This is very serious, my friend. Uh, when we got hit by this power surge that took out our broadcast system, our main broadcast system, right now we're, we're sailing as best we can with an interim system that allows us to do very very basic you know the titles at the bottom the animation uh, launch our, our our promos and things like that our, our intro and extra but we have not enough power on this system um, to power more than one camera uh, so we're stuck with one camera and also we lost two microphones so as I've previously mentioned this microphone that I'm using is, is loaned to us 
by Music Pro on the south end of Barrie, and I always encourage people to, to go check them out, show, their, uh, show your support for them supporting us uh, by letting us use this microphone just to get us through this interim as we, as we work to raise funds uh, both through advertising and through viewer donations to try to replace the defective hardware. So with Eric, um, he is on standby. He's, he's going to be coming in very soon. Uh, we've talked about uh, possibly having him, him come in and we'll, we'll kind of rotate a little bit or whatever we need to do uh, just to get him back on the air. But as it is, we've only got one camera. We've only got two microphones, including the loner. So, so we're kind of stuck. And that's also why we're, we're doing the old, what I call the switcheroo with the newsroom at the moment, because we're just limited based on the hardware that we're using in the interim. So once we're back up full full force with with the replacement hardware, then we will be back to having multiple cameras and all that kind of stuff. As well as that uh, should be noted, one of the other things that we're having to do right now is, is kind of tone down the quality of the broadcast, which we'll be able to tone back up uh, once we're once we're back up and running. So all right. You can you can show your support on our website, cat five dot TV slash C and that will take you straight to the uh, donate page. And uh, we appreciate everything that, uh, uh, the, the, any, any amount that you're able to support us for. So thank you for the question. Great. Let's, uh, let's fire into some more questions. Great. We actually tonight have a couple Twitter questions. Cool. So our first one is from Kay Goosey. He says, hey, Goosey, at you, Kay Goosey. At Kay Are you still using your Unraid box? If so, how is it still working out for your needs? Cool. Um, so I'm going to see if I can actually get that up on the screen. You can you can tweet us uh, by heading over to twitter.com slash Robbie Ferguson. I'm at Robbie Ferguson, or there's at Category 5 TV as well. Um, here's the question that actually came in to uh, at Robbie Ferguson. Uh, so am I still using my Unraid box? Absolutely. Um, we set up this uh, this machine, which basically is, is just old used hardware, just kind of mm -hmm. stuff that was laying around, and built a data storage server. Uh, you've heard of the Drobo? Mm -hmm. So it's very similar to that in that the drives don't have to match. They can be any size drive. You can, If one of them fails, you can take it out and replace it with another drive, and it rebuilds, and you don't lose any data. Cool. So it's very cool. Mm -hmm. um, Unraid is a software solution, though, that lets you turn any piece of computer hardware, PC hardware, into a very Drobo-like system. But you're not limited to four drives. You can put in as many drives as you like. Uh, we've got eight drives in ours. Wow. So, and and it's, it's very affordable. So, and because you can run cool. it on old hardware, I put, on, I put it on an old P4 uh, that, uh, that I had just like a trade-in or something. So I uh, built it into that. And I still yeah. use it. We use it for um, our, our first level of redundancy here uh, for data storage. Uh, it has a lot of space on it. It's like four terabytes, so um, like its entire capacity. And a couple times, I've actually upgraded a couple times there, uh, Kevin. So uh, I've actually had to take out a drive and put in a bigger drive, let it rebuild to that bigger drive, and see, wow, my data's there, but now all of a sudden I've got more space. Uh, so Unraid has proven itself to be a fantastic solution. Uh, we've even had uh, two drives at, not at the same time, but two drives at two different times, fortunately, uh, that failed. Pulled out those drives, replaced them, and uh, everything rebuilt and no data lost. So it works great. How is it working for my needs, he asks. Um, fantastically. I mean, everything from just to have that amount of space and to know that it is redundant in a sense it is only it, it is a single point of failure so you still have to treat it that way there still has to be a backup of that device and that's that's how I do it but um, but it is nice to know that if a hard drive crashes to rebuild it is just take out that hard drive and put in another drive and you're done and you're good to go uh, but it works fantastically so cool thanks for the question and uh, you can tweet me at Robbie Ferguson on Twitter and there's another Twitter question in here cool. from at Andrew Jamison. Jamison, Jamison sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and he says, at Robbie Ferguson, hey. my video camera does not support an external mic. Is there an easy way to overlay an external, external audio track to sync with the voice? Hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there are so many different cool devices. This question coming from A. Jamison on Twitter. 
Uh, let's see. Uh, I've done a couple of reviews of similar products, and I'm trying to think of the names of them. And Google is our friend because it lets me <laughs> type in category five and then the name of the product and it and it lets <laughs> me just jump right to it. The the first thing that comes to mind, we reviewed a projector from Olens uh, a long, long time ago. I'm talking like years ago. Uh, being in our fourth season, we've we've gone through a lot of product and that we've reviewed, and we reviewed this projector up here. Now this company Olens also manufactures this uh, me quarter, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Now it it takes an input from at least from a device, but I don't know that this one will plug directly into a microphone. Any audio signal and voice such as cassette tapes, phonograph, CD, radio, etc. So I don't know if it will power a microphone, but that kind of device is what I'm thinking. Something where um, you can just plug your microphone into it, record directly to MP3, and I can you know I can go through and make several suggestions. But there are tons of different devices that are like that. Uh, you can get a, a decent enough microphone, put a windscreen on it so that uh, you can use it outdoors, and um, and then plug it into one of those devices and record it directly to MP3 or, or lossless wave. Or what I usually do is I use um, a wireless mic and connect it to a laptop computer. So then what you do is you're filming your shot. Your camera doesn't have the ability to, to use a, a secondary microphone, so you're kind of limited as far as the sound quality goes. And the built-in microphones, as you know, they're built f for the home user. If it's a consumer camera, they're built to pick up everything because if you're filming the kids, you, you want to be able to hear everything that's going on, and that's the way they build it. So if you're trying to do an interview or trying to talk on, on a video and you're standing on a busy street, you're going to hear everything that's going on, and it's, it's no good for that kind of application. So you get, uh, you get a laptop or one of these devices if you want to get a battery-powered device that will record to MP3 and just plug a microphone directly into that. Stick with a, a half-decent XLR microphone, uh, like a, I'm thinking like a Shure, uh, is it the XM58 or something along those lines that would, you know, just be a, a good all-around microphone. I'll say that and I'll, I'll totally, it's a SM58, sorry. I was like, SM or XM? It's been a long time since I've worked with one. Uh, but it's just something, you know, like a vocal mic that's just straight like that. And then a cord that would go from XLR into a uh, quarter inch. And then you can take the quarter inch and convert it over to uh, eighth inch if you absolutely need to. So with that, then using something, if you're on Linux, you can use something like OpenShot and you've got the, you know, the, the ability to move your track around. And you really just have to synchronize the track. And when you see, um, I don't know, uh, Hillary, if you could pass me the, oh, maybe you can't reach it, but the clap, uh, the clapper there, or the clicker, or whatever you call it, the, uh, you know, the chick chick, the marker. <laughs> Thanks. The, Hillary the goes to term, school. The chick Hillary chick. goes to school for this stuff, so she knows the technical terms. Thank you, darling. So this here, you've seen these. Oh, here, let's let's get out here a little bit. <laughs> you've seen these uh, being used in TV production. Very good when? At that. Thank you, Hill. When they do this, Andrew, okay, that's an audio tick that they synchronize to the video. So as I do that, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> as you do that, it, um, that's great, dollar store. <laughs> <laughs> but they have better quality ones in the stores. But as you do that, the video track then knows, okay, at that moment is when that click is supposed to happen. They see in the, video, in the audio track that that's where the spike in audio is, and they can line that up. OpenShot will do it. Uh, OpenShot, unfortunately, doesn't have wavetable um, visualization yet, I don't think, but you can hear audibly if it's right at that right tick. And then you just leave the camera recording, you leave the microphone recording, you're good to go. So um, you just need to synchronize it up. So drag your track, and you're good to go. Hope that helps. That, I think, is the easiest way. Cool. Uh, if you would like to uh, tweet us, again, it's at Robbie Ferguson. You'll be able to get your questions in on Twitter. I think that's a cool, uh, a cool way to interact with the show. Mm -hmm. And, of course, our chat room, Category 5 on Freenode or right on our website. And you can email live at category5.tv. Cool. Well, we've got some other questions here. 
Good. Um, so from Victor Morales, Morales. Uh, great topic about the OpenShot video editor. Of course, the only issue is that you must use it with a great enhanced workstation, whether it be a desktop or a laptop, because OpenShot needs resources to work. So if you don't have a good video card, your PC will become slower. This is the case mm -hmm. with my system. Best regards from Costa Rica. Especially, hey. especially if you're doing some uh, 3D visual production, that's mm -hmm. going to take a long time because a lot of times that kind of rendering process is going to tap into your GPU, the graphics card, because you've got if you've got an NVIDIA card, it's got those CUDA cores, and those just allow so much more to take place. Um, and and you're right. If if you if you want to do any kind of serious production, especially if you're working in HD, uh, it should be noted that uh, that you will need to have a pretty exceptional system. If you're just working with you know SD video, or if you're just editing something down for YouTube, it's not so much. If you're working with something that you've pulled off your iPhone or something, like it's it's not a HD video, so uh, that's a little different. But you're you're certainly right. These days, a lot of computers. I mean, that said, if you have if you've bought a new computer in the past couple of years, you're you're going to have at least a dual core system with you know four, eight, maybe twelve gigs of RAM. If you are instead using a system that's that's getting dated then yeah, you, you may not have the ability to do uh, heavy video editing. If you want to get really serious about it, then you've got to start looking at doing things like a, a RAID 0 or a solid state hard drives in order to pull some of the load off of your, your uh, hard drives. Because and we encounter this with the show, certainly, um, it, as you're reading and writing data to the hard drive at, at such high rates, it can, it can take a long time and it can cause some, some issues. So definitely true. Thanks for the, uh, thanks for the comments. Here's another one from Codars360. It's hey just there. a comment. He says, right. just a quick tip for everybody who wants to test their website for consistency on all browsers. Check out browsershots.org. Browsershots.org. Great tip. Hmm. This is a, a pretty cool service um, that, I, and I, I, I've seen things like this, but how do they possibly have so many different browsers available for testing? I think they use like maybe virtualization to emulate, you know, to actually run these browsers okay. and take snapshots. It's something very custom. So how does it work exactly then? Like you don't have the browser downloaded on your computer, so do you right. just and click on it and it does? Yeah. What? So I don't let's know. let's take a look. This is browsershots.org. Okay. And what's neat about it? Let's. Can I use your website? Is that? Yeah. Go okay. ahead. Okay. So. Cwellsdesigns.com. If you want to send any money anywhere, that's where you want to send it. <laughs> um, so I've just hit that and submit, and I've just gone with the defaults. I'm just using the defaults, mm -hmm. and see, it's it's submitted. It's going to take three minutes to two hours. Wow! Because I've selected 67 browsers. So what's happening is that it's gone out to, I guess, a bunch of different virtual systems. They're running these different browsers. Mm -hmm. They're loading your website. They're taking a screenshot and then they're putting the picture here. Oh, okay, for us so to it's see. done at an external yeah. kind of area, and then they send it back to you. So it's helpful from a graphic layout standpoint, mm -hmm. but where it's not very helpful is that it doesn't allow you to experience. Well, how does the menu function on my right. website? If I if I open it in Internet Explorer, is are the margins going to be wrong because Internet Explorer mm -hmm. doesn't use compliancy when it comes to their CSS? That is interesting. Okay, we've got our first one in. And this is on uh, Kazahakase. Oh, I use that one all the time. Running under Ubuntu. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and you wouldn't think to necessarily install that. Typically, a web designer, you're going to you're gonna use, you're going to want to cross-test with, I guess, Internet Explorer and a couple of the versions mm -hmm. down to version 7, I suppose. If anyone's using version 6, you need to tell them to get mm. off of it. Um, <laughs> and a lot of times, that's what will, what will happen is you'll, if you're using version 6, a lot of web designers now are actually putting a warning message on the site that says, hey, you're using an old version of your browser. Mm -hmm. Do you know that's how those viruses get into your system? That's how those fake antivirus, fake Windows XP antivirus gets <laughs> into your system because you're using an old browser and you're not using safe browsing techniques. So, But this saves you having to install all that from, from a visual perspective. Let's see how it's coming along. Are they still loading? Oh yeah, starting to get okay. some now. And it's nice that it's across different platforms. Firefox on Ubuntu 8. 
So back to 2008. Again, old browsers, right? There it is. Cool. Cool. Thanks for oh, the tip. That's really neat. That's browsershots.org. And definitely a, a good one to check out. All right, so tonight I want to, uh, if, if uh, are there still more questions? I want to I want to cover question. a little bit more video stuff. Yeah? Uh, looks we, like it might take... Uh, hours upon hours? Shall we come back to it? Sure. If we, if How we about if we have, have some time, time we'll, uh, we'll try to get it in. Okay, perfect. And if you've sent in a question and we don't get to you tonight, uh, we will make sure that we get to you very, very soon. Pardon me. Okay, so we're going to bring up OpenShot. Last week we got started with OpenShot Video Editor. Very mm -hmm. cool stuff. Uh, and really is, is an exceptional product. And uh, tonight we're doing part two of our series, which you'll find at cat5.tv slash. Uh, that is vidprod. I wanted to say web dev after 12 <laughs> weeks of doing the web development. Uh, so here we are in OpenShot. And within this application, what I'm going to do, what I want to show you tonight is just very simply, we've got, uh, last week we wanted to touch on it, we didn't get a chance. I've got our episode 193 and our backstage pass for 193. Now, when we broadcast Category 5 TV, we're broadcasting in 16 over 9 widescreen format. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a widescreen monitor, you blow that up to full screen, it's going to fill that screen perfectly. Uh, if you're using a 4 over 3 monitor, you're going to have black bars at the top and the bottom just like traditional widescreen. So when we're editing the video, we're actually editing it in widescreen. So this preview window here is showing us the video in widescreen. So what happens if I put something into my timeline that has that is 4 over 3, for example, our backstage pass video, you'll see what happens is, is you get you see part of the underlying video on the left and right because we've got a 4 over 3 video mm -hmm. which doesn't fill the whole frame put on top of the, the widescreen video. So we need to make sure that our videos are set up so that they reach the edges of the video that we're trying to produce. And the easiest thing to do is to do that right from the get-go. First drag your video into the timeline and then start cutting it up from there. That way you don't have to necessarily do this to every little clip because you've already done it to the master video and then and then you're able to uh, just place your video anywhere you like. So if we wanted to take that uh, video there, that's our backstage pass, and you can view backstage pass on our website, category5.tv during a live show. Okay, so there's Krista and I from the backstage pass camera. And if I now right-click on that and go Properties, this is another one of those things, Chris Reich, uh, that were greatly improved with uh, the PPA edition or uh, the newer version of OpenShot is the ability to zoom in your videos, uh, your ability to change the layout of that video. You'll see on the Layout tab, as we look at the properties for this video clip, which is 4 over 3 in our 16 over 9 video, we've got the ability to change the height and the width. Now, we'd like to do that proportionally, so we can either use these sliders and try to match it up, or what I'm going to do is I'm going to go 150% by 150%. So that way we're maintaining the aspect ratio. And it is exactly 150% both ways. So now you'll see that it is, if we apply that, it's larger, but it's still showing my arm there on the left hand side because we haven't actually positioned it now that we've made it larger and now it's cutting me off there. So if I again, I'm back there and I'm going to go into properties and layout. I didn't need to hit apply, I just wanted to demonstrate that for you. So now we've got the ability to move it using X and Y. X is your horizontal axis, so that's left to right, and Y is your up to down. Okay. So if I want to make it up, I'm going to use a negative number, so I'm going to go minus let's say 20 okay and then if I remember this is in percentage so minus 20 I can still kind of see the top of the C on category 5 I might make it let's try minus 18 there we go so now the C is gone and in order for me to apply that so that I can just preview it all I'm doing is I'm just dragging the slider at the bottom here because that applies the the setting for me so now I've set it so that uh, vertically it's good on my y-axis so now I'm going to take my X to move it left, 
And because we know we've made it 150% wider and 150% higher, I'm actually going to set that to a nice even 25% so that it is, in fact, centered. Okay? So now, backstage pass is going to, in fact, I'm just applying that. And now you'll see that it actually fills the entire frame of my video. Okay, so if I want to use that, and I can still move it around, I can see the C is still there a little bit, and I can move that around. Um, that allows me to, uh, to do that. So if you ladies would like to uh, switch places, we're going to hit the news in just a couple of moments. Um, if you have questions about OpenShot Video Editor, make sure you pop us an email live at category5.tv. And uh, over the course of the next several weeks, we're going to be doing little segments, uh, not necessarily all about OpenShot Video Editor, but we are dealing with uh, video editing on the Linux platform using free software. So uh, if you're interested in that, make sure you uh, keep watch on cat5.tv slash vidprod, and that'll be uh, the place to be. Good stuff. Hey, Hill. Hey, everyone. Surprise. Mic's on. We're good I'm to go. Good. Yeah? I'm good to go. Fantastic. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's good to see you. Thanks. Good to be here. Yeah. Um, before we go into the news, though, I have to tell you this week's dollar store find. What did you dun, do? Da, da, da. Yeah. Beam me up, Scotty. Oh, Hello. sweet. A young, skinny Scotty. Indeed. Look at that. Cool. So, that's for you. Do you want to tell them the idea that we had? So, we've had this scathingly brilliant idea. Well, we're doing a video production on Linux series. We thought it would be appropriate to incorporate said dollar store finds in a um, stop motion freeze frame picture video by moving these little these little fellas. And we're going to make our own Star Wars. I don't know if you can see this. Star Trek, not Star Wars. <laughs> Star Trek Wars. Sorry, I meant like a... The entire community I know, just you're went, all did she just <laughs> say Star Wars? I didn't mean Star Wars. I meant Star Trek. I know you meant Star Trek. You fight meant love like and not hate. Oh, no. Please don't hate, guys. These <laughs> I say, know the difference. These trust. are fully articulating and poseable. So I think yeah. they might do quite well to uh, be incorporated into our video production I series. I think so. As we... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you gotta find some girls though, because otherwise it's gonna be Eric and I doing all the voiceovers. I uh, well, except Hil uh, Hillary and Krista both do a, a very good deep voice impression, especially Krista. Mm. I think. Yes, Krista has, has got it down. You wouldn't even know. <laughs> you wouldn't know. She's not good. <laughs> Look at me, I am Scotty. <laughs> so we'll see. We'll see what what I can find in my next dollar. That's store fantastic. Time. But uh, got two so far. We gotta find out what dollar store she's shopping at. That's got all this Trek <laughs> stuff. Hey, hey, it's just. A good find. Very cool. Thanks, Hill. No problem. I'm going to have a lot of fun with that. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> well, hey, we are all about fun on Category 5. All so, about it. it's only fitting, really. <laughs> Anyways, moving right along into important matters like the news, I'm going to tell you the ways of the world which you never knew. From the Category 5 to the news room. You may recall our guest from April, Loudon Owen, chairman of I4I in Toronto. When he was on Category 5 TV, he shared with us what their Supreme Court lawsuit against Microsoft meant to patent holders. While no doubt Loudon is celebrating this week, a Supreme Court on Thursday unanimously um, upheld the $290 million award against Microsoft in their patent dispute, where I for I claimed a version of Microsoft Word had infringed upon its patented method for editing documents. At the recent trial, which we discussed with Luden on episode 187, the jury rejected Microsoft's argument that the patent was invalid and is upholding the original ruling, which goes back to the lawsuit which was filed in 2007. RSA, the makers of Secure ID, has finally admitted publicly that the breach of their systems we reported back in March has resulted in the compromising of their Secure ID two factor authentication tokens. The admission comes in the wake of cyber intrusions into the networks of three U.S. military contractors. Um, RSA's chairman, Art Covelio, has stated the company is offering to replace the nearly 40 million security tokens currently in use or to provide security monitoring services. For financial institutions, RSA is offering to also provide transaction monitoring. 
and Facebook has apologized for the way it rolled out a new system that recognizes users' faces and says they should have done more to notify members about the global launch. Its Tag Suggestions feature scans uploaded photos and automatically picks out existing friends. Although users have the option to switch it off, some complained that they were not explicitly asked if they wanted it activated in the first place. Facebook said that the system was intended to speed up the process of assigning a name to a picture, known as tagging. Graham Cooley, senior consultant with the security firm Sophos, Sophos? Um, said, once again, Facebook seems to be sharing personal information by default. He adds, many people feel distinctly uncomfortable about a site like Facebook learning um, what they look like, that's kind of creepy, and using that information without their permission. Ooh. So what are your thoughts about Facebook being able to recognize you? I think it's kind of lurky myself, but you can send us an email at newsroom at category5.tv and let us know what you think. And you can get these full stories online at our website at category5.tv slash newsroom. The category5.tv newsroom is researched by Roy W. Nash with contributions from our fabulous community of viewers. If you have a story you think is worthy of on-air mention, send us an email at newsroom at category5.tv. From the Category 5.TV newsroom, I'm Hillary Rumble. Thanks, Hill. No With that Facebook thing, I think the, the scary thing is that you know Facebook well enough to know that somebody's going to figure an app that can get around yeah. whatever security <laughs> that they put in place no, to make it so that true. only your friends have access to this. And then you think if, if they can figure that out, if they can tap into this kind of technology on Facebook, what's to stop somebody from seeing you in the mall and snapping a picture of you with their yeah. iPhone and getting your name and personal information and so easy and know where you are ominous and, and yeah like it's like total lurking all the time someone can always know where you are I have an idea and, let's yeah. hit, let's make mm. it really really easy for stalkers <laughs> seriously <laughs> unbelievable that, that's, that's it is what it could is could be though. the slogan of Facebook and Twitter and Whatever else and geotagging. The slogan for geotagging. There it is. <laughs> Make it really easy for stalkers. <laughs> Turn Seriously. off geotagging. Stay off Facebook. But I'm addicted. I'm addicted <laughs> to Facebook. I cannot deny really? this. I love it. And that makes me nervous because I don't want people, you know, mega lurking me. And, and yeah. And do you, now, do you authorize people that you don't know in person to no. be friends? That's no. the key, I think. But then you always hear about how it's compromised and how yeah. people still have access to your personal stuff. It's true. Your pictures and things. And well, even if you Google, a lot of times you Google your own name yeah. and Facebook will be the first hit that comes up and it'll really? take you to your, your page and depending on your security settings, like it can have your picture or no pictures or like where you live. Like, so you have to really be on top of your, your security settings right. because they're constantly evolving and, and, and even if you think that you've got yourself protected, the scary thing is, is if other people are not, they've got open mm -hmm. profiles, they've got pictures of you, they've it's, got it's, information no, about you. Yeah. It's this it's massive network true. of lurkiness. <laughs> scary stuff. So yeah, that's that. I think so. No problem. This episode of Category 5 TV is brought to you by Pogoplug at cat5.tv slash Pogoplug and Planet Calypso. Join us in the massive multiplayer online game, cat5.tv slash Calypso. Thanks for being here. No problem. Thanks for the toy. Hey, that's what I'm here for. Can't wait to uh, to set that up. Uh, tonight we are going to be talking about Ubuntu. Uh, if you've installed Ubuntu uh, with Unity, that's Ubuntu 11.04. Um, just to back up a little bit, Ubuntu is a Linux desktop operating system. Uh, or some would say, no, no, it's not an operating system. It's, it's uh, uh, accumulation of open source products to create... Uh, a desktop environment for someone's computer. Uh, there's really no phrase to say it without stump stepping on someone's toes. The fact is, is that it is a, uh, an alternative to Microsoft Windows on your computer. It'll run on your PC hardware, and it gives you access to free software beyond belief. And here I am running Linux, and everything that I do uh, that you see on the screen is is running on this system called Ubuntu Linux. And Ubuntu is a fantastic uh, accumulation of software or fantastic operating system that's available for you for free. But recently, as of late, they are really working to push the desktop towards the touchscreen device. I really get that impression hmm. from the way that things are going with the, with the software itself. The desktop, which is now Unity, 
is what it's called. If you go to Ubuntu.com, you'll see that the interface has changed quite substantially from what you see on my screen uh, because I'm using what's called GNOME and I'm using an older version of Ubuntu so that I can really just stick with that version of GNOME that, I, that I've come to love and really like the, uh, the layout and the way that it works. But they're really putting a push towards this whole, you know, touch screen devices, multi-touch, you know, getting Linux on this kind of device mm -hmm. and getting Linux on tablets and getting Linux on uh, laptops that have touch screens and, and all this different stuff. But really it feels, if you've, if you've used Unity, it starts to feel like they've left the desktop user in the dust. If you use a mouse, you've been forgotten. That's how it, it really, you get that feeling from the, the new Unity desktop. Unfortunately, you know, I would say, well, let's just use GNOME, and you see that uh, Ubuntu does have a classic mode that will allow you to run Ubuntu 11.04 in GNOME, and we've covered that previously. <laughs> However, GNOME 3 is going much the same direction of, of Unity, in, in that, uh, and it actually kind of started before them, I think, uh, where it is designed for that kind of interface. So it's, you know, a, a touch screen on your fridge and being able to move things around. And yes, that's the future, but it doesn't help us with our current devices where it is very much a desktop uh, we're very used to and and not that I won't not that I won't change but we're very used to using our mouse in a certain way and when I click on something it's got to behave a certain way uh, Mac users I guess it's not quite the same because you're mm -hmm. used to hitting the command key and clicking versus a PC user who really expects a certain behavior when you right click right mm -hmm. so with Ubuntu now I've been fair and I, I always try to be objective with my reviews and with my uh, testing software and things like that with Ubuntu 11.04, I installed it um, roughly a month ago, <clears throat> I guess. That would be about right. And during that month, I ran nothing but Unity as my desktop environment. Experience has been... It's horrified. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's not that lovely to a desktop user. I use a mouse, right? And now I'm using a trackball. Mm -hmm. And Unity is... It, it just feels like it's not ready for mainstream. That's probably personal opinion, but I'll tell you, I've had more tr trouble with running things in Unity and, and getting it to do the things that it really should be able to do and the things that GNOME can do. For example, I have two monitors on my desk. One of them is horizontal, one of them is vertical. Mm -hmm. So the one monitor is taller than it is wide. Ubuntu now with 11.04 does not support that configuration. If you want to have two monitors, they're the same orientation. They can, one can be bigger than the other, but they're the same orientation. They're both landscape or they're both uh, vertical. Uh, unfortunately, that didn't suit my needs. So Too bad. Yeah. So what I had to do is I had to go both Switch of them. Switch to Mac. Oh. No, I had is that to go not where you're going? That's horizontal. Oh, sorry. I didn't go to Mac. <laughs> no, I'm not spending $10,000 on hardware. <laughs> I already okay. have good hardware. It's just getting the software to work for me. It. I don't know. I don't know about that. Okay, so we've got... <laughs> that is an issue. Mm -hmm. Little things like hitting Alt-F2 to run your applications and not being able to paste from your clipboard the command that you want to run. How many times have you been on Linux? And this is you know, not meant to be a rant, but if you're on Linux, here I am on Ubuntu, and if I hit Alt-F2 on GNOME and I have something in my clipboard, it will paste into there. If I've copied a, you know, if I'm following a tutorial or something, it works if I want to paste something in. Mm -hmm. In Unity, if you want to paste something in, it does not work. So that's, there's some big problems. It's unstable. It crashes. I'll be using FileZilla, and FileZilla has never crashed for me ever in my usage of FileZilla. Mm -hmm. And that same version of FileZilla that I use on my older version of Ubuntu, which works fine on that version, just simply loses mouse responsiveness in Unity. It's still running. If I save my file, it'll still upload it, but it doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't let me click on it. So so I have a couple of biffs with Unity for sure. So tonight I want to show you some alternatives. And we know that GNOME is unfortunately going that direction. So if we continue to go with GNOME, then we're eventually going to run into exactly the same problem because GNOME 3 is going to push us towards that type of desktop. So there's a couple of different things that we can do, and here I've got uh, an 11.04 system set up, and I'm running it in uh, Ubuntu uh, Classic mode right now. And I'm going to go into System Administration Synaptic Package Manager. And from within there, there are two that I'll recommend that uh, 
that you could possibly try. First one is called LXDE. And LXDE is a very streamlined desktop environment for your Linux system. Now this is assuming you've already installed Ubuntu. So you've got 11.04 on there with Unity, but you're saying, oh, I can't stand this Unity. I've given it a chance and I just can't get used to it or I just don't like it or I just can't stand the fact that my programs crash. It's just not a good scenario, right? We can't work like that. LXDE, according to the repository here, uh, the lightweight X11 desktop environment. It's a new project aimed to providing a new desktop environment which is lightweight and fast. So do a search in Synaptic Package Manager simply for LXDE and click on that and install it and you will, uh, you'll get all the meta packages. There are a few but LXDE is again very lightweight. I think it's under around 300 megabytes um, so very very light but it's going to tap into if you've already installed Ubuntu you've already got some of those tools installed like uh, your word processors and things that you uh, the GNOME extensions that allow you to create users and, and various things that are still going to work under LXDE but you don't need to install them separately because they're already there because you've installed Ubuntu. Second one I'm going to recommend that you could try and you could try either or, you could try both is go with XFCE4 package and again just install that package. You'll notice that I'm not asking you to install Zubuntu and the reason for that is because when you do install Zubuntu, it's a meta package. And what it means as a meta package with Zubuntu desktop, okay, let's say I, I go and mark that for installation. You'll see that this is going to install, for one thing, it's going to uninstall Ubuntu desktop. I don't necessarily want to uninstall Ubuntu desktop. I just want to add, okay, but you'll see it's adding a ton of stuff because it is what's called a meta package because that's going to basically convert your computer as if you had installed Zubuntu. So instead we're going the route of installing XFCE4. So you still get XFCE just like you do in Zubuntu but you don't get all the extra stuff that is gonna waste, uh, waste space and, and you're not gonna lose the Ubuntu desktop. Okay, so that's installed. So now, once we've got those installed, now I've already done it just to save time on the show. You can click on this icon up here, and we don't need to reboot or anything. We're just going to go log out. And now once we log out, that's going to allow us to, in fact, switch our session to either of the newly installed desktops. So I'll let you see what, what each of those looks like. And, and this, I hope, is going to give you a little bit of a perception of how Linux works as far as la last week when we were doing video production we talked about how um, OpenShot is able to tap into all the different applications that are open source and free and it uses them within its applications. So similarly here what we're doing is we're changing the the DE or the desktop environment for Ubuntu Linux. We're not removing Ubuntu Linux, we're not changing operating systems, we're just changing the desktop environment. So we still have access to all the same programs all the same applications that we have installed, all the same features, but we're changing the way that it functions on our screen, the way that we're able to interact with it. So if you're stuck on Unity, here now we're able to use something like uh, like XFCE, for example. So now if I click on my name, single click, I'm going to click on Admin, and you'll see that down at the bottom of the screen now, you've got this pull up menu. We now have LXDE as an option, as well as XFCE. So let's start with LXDE. So you notice I haven't rebooted or anything and there's there's really nothing to it. LXDE is is attractive from if you start with the Ubuntu server, I find that because it doesn't come with the GNOME extensions and the GNOME stuff, it can be a little bit harder to get it configured to the place that you want it to be. Uh, whereas XFCE, it's it um, is a little bit different in the way, like it's a bigger uh, program, but uh, both of them are worth checking out. So there we are in LXDE, and you'll see that now the menu is at the bottom, and it's almost exactly like what you're used to with GNOME. <coughs> Pardon me.
So you see, you've still got access to your LibreOffice that came with Ubuntu. You've still got all of the stuff that you have installed. Okay. And that allows you to then load now that now LXDE is my default because I've loaded it once. So <clears throat> I've got a tickle in my throat, so that's why I'm like, <clears throat> I, <can't clears throat> I thought you just wanted everyone's attention, so you're yes. <clears throat> <clears throat> attention, everybody. <clears throat> I See? am speaking. That's the man voice. Oh, that wasn't even the man that voice. That was like Scotty. Maybe, maybe next show I will talk in my man voice. Just like that. See, it that's what I scared everyone off. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> The stuff I deal with. Impressive. <laughs> so LXDE, I have to say, I'm impressed with. It's lightweight, it's fast, and uh, it is going to be a nice replacement for our uh, Unity desktop. I'm going to log out of LXDE. It's got a nice little uh, logout screen there. And here we go. So now we're going to boot into XFCE is another option. And again, you can have these things installed. You can have more than one installed. You can switch between them if you want, or you can play around with them and see which one you decide is your favorite, and then uh, and use that from then on. <clears throat> okay, once again, I'm going to single click on my name, or my login, down here, I'm going to change that to XFCE. And the reason that I'm bringing these up for you is I want you to have a chance to see, and maybe you'll say, oh, well, I, I like the look of XFCE better. It's more, it's closer to what I'm used to with GNOME. So it gives you a chance to get an idea what, uh, what each system is going to look like on your Ubuntu 11.04 clean install. Okay. And it is very fast. Just so you know, I'm running this on a, uh, a slow uh, system that is, has got a lot running, <laughs> as you know. So it will run faster on your system, I guarantee you. Both of these desktop environments are quite fast. So this is XFCE. It comes with a little bit of a dock bar at the bottom, which is configurable. And your applications menu is back up at the top, if that's what you're used to. It looks really good. Let's see, once it, uh, once it all loads, it is running uh, slower than normal at the moment, just probably with everything that's going on with the show. But there you go, again... All of your applications, everything is exactly where you would expect it. You go to Office, and there's your LibreOffice. You can change that if you want. Um, this is more of the traditional GNOME feel, I think, than the other. But both are, are viable alternatives to, uh, to the Unity desktop on Ubuntu. So give those two a try. And if you are coming from Windows, you might also try KDE. Uh, I am personally a, a GNOME fan uh, as far as that goes, and, and uh, but some Windows users have said that they prefer that. But uh, we can't possibly cover all desktop environments that are available in the mm -hmm. course of the show. But just so you're aware that if you've heard that Unity is, is not what you're looking for, if you think that, wow, that's, that's a showstopper when it comes to, to Ubuntu, you can still get Ubuntu. You can still take advantage of the fact that it has great repositories, it's got great support, it's got... Um, a, a very constant uh, upgrade cycle and consistent I should say so you can still take advantage of that while giving yourself a desktop environment that you feel more comfortable with and not having to have unity forced on you so hope that's uh, hope that's helped any questions in the chat room we'd love to hear from you uh, category 5.tv and uh, you can also get us on freenode cat category 5 on freenode have there been any questions there, or do you have any questions? Uh, there was that one question that we didn't get to. Oh, okay. We, yeah, uh, okay. Well, if uh, that. that pretty much wraps up that. So, <laughs> hope you learned something today. <laughs> so, fun. here's a question from Dennis Kelly. Uh, hey, Dennis. He's using Ubuntu 10.1. Okay. Question, can you do a walkthrough how to move my home folder to another partition? I've tried it, but my system ends up crashing. Oh, Okay. So Ubuntu uh, October's uh, release from last year um, and wants to move the home system. Now you ask if you can move it to another partition. What would be the purpose in moving it to another partition as opposed to another drive? Um, if you move it to another partition, you're just causing your system to have to access it. You know, your, your drive is, 
if you picture a pie that's cut up into two pieces now, your head has to move between those two pieces and, and you're actually slowing down performance quite potentially. So uh, if you're moving it to another drive, you're actually increasing performance because you're doubling the throughput of your of your, your data because you've got your OS on one drive, you've got your data on another drive, and it's it's doubling the amount of bandwidth that you have. So if you're if you're wherever you're moving it to, basically what what he's asking here is to take uh, the home folder, which uh, you know from Mac that mm -hmm. it's it's where all your installed uh, the applications configurations go, yeah. like the configuration files okay. for those applications. Okay. Um, the files when you create files, they're all within that folder. Uh, Windows users would be familiar with like documents and settings. Everything below that folder is really your settings, your My Documents, your this and that, your desktop, all that. So the home folder on Linux is similar to that. It's where all of your stuff is. But um, one of the things that you can do with Linux that's really, really nice is you can move that to another drive and you can, like I say, double the, the speed of the, the drive access because one drive is running all your apps and the other one is getting all your data. And so it can it can really increase performance. Plus it allows you to take that drive and you've got all of your stuff on that one drive. Very, cool. very nice for backing up that one drive and things like that. So in in a case like that, what you really need to do is you, you'd set up the second drive, uh, or if you are using partition, that's fine, but I would ask again why you would do that, um, because I think that's a negative uh, impact on your system. But if it's a second, if it's a new drive, what I would do is um, boot up from your Ubuntu Live CD or any Linux Live CD that gives you access to mounting drives and partitions. Uh, you can't do it from the booted operating system on the hard drive because your home folder is in use as soon as it gets booted, right? So, um, so boot from your CD instead. Mount the, you know, the first hard drive, the one that contains your current home folder. And then mount your uh, the the empty hard drive that you're going to be putting the home folder on. Copy that uh, that home folder, or potentially move that home folder if you trust the drive completely. Keep a backup. Always keep a backup. Move that home folder onto the new drive, and then um, using FS tab, you're going to need to know um, the UUID of that new hard drive that you've put in, and your mount point is going to be slash home. So, what happens then? Now there has to be a folder still on your main hard drive called slash home, but that folder has to now be empty, right? Because what we're going to do is we're going to turn that into what's called a mount point. So it becomes, in Linux it's neat because you don't have a C drive and a D drive. You can have multiple drives and they're all different pieces of your file system. So if programs get installed to slash etc slash, or say slash usr slash bin, Right, there's a bunch of program data there. You can put that on its own very own drive. So it's pretty cool. So once you've moved that stuff out of there, there still needs to be that home folder, and then you tell FS tab, that's in etc. So it's a file in your slash etc folder, okay? If I bring it up. So let's say we've already moved that stuff, right? So let's use gedit just because you'll be more familiar with it. We'll go sudo gedit fs tab. Okay. Notice I've already gone to cd slash etc. The etc folder being the folder that contains this particular file, the file system table. All right. And within that file, it contains all the information about your mounted hard drives. So for me, it looks something like that. Okay. I've got, this is the UUID of this hard drive, and it's mounted on slash. TXT4, blah, 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 okay? So for you, what you may do is you install that new hard drive, you get the UUID with a command called BLKID, and you then copy that, okay? And you paste, you can paste that and paste the UUID of the new drive there, okay? So replace that, so your new drive goes there, and then mount that on slash home. Okay, all the other stuff can remain the same if it's an ext4 file system as well. Okay, so then save that, and then you would type sudo mount a, and that remounts all hard drives from fs tab. Well, I guess you wouldn't do that until you know it's you're going to reboot is what you're going to do because you're booted from the live cd. But 
I hope that all makes sense. BLKID is the, the tool that I was telling you about that will tell you the UUID of your drive. sudo blkid dev sda1, right? So it tells you the, the UID of, I guess what I would do is sda, I don't know. But look up, look that up. I'm right out of time, but uh, blkid tells you the UUID of the drive, and then you can paste that into your fs tab, and you're good to go. Cool. Keep a backup. You're messing with your, your data. Great. <laughs> yeah, do you have fun this week? Oh, loads of fun. Good, good. Fun, fun. You can vote for your favorite episode, whichever one was the most fun, at our website, category5.tv. We'd encourage you to do so so that you could help us determine the most loved episodes of Category 5 TV. Also, uh, I would encourage you to check out our blip.tv page uh, on the new blip TV blip.tv slash category five and in the meantime we are out of here out of time wow yeah goes fast it sure does nice to have you ladies here thanks for being here nice to have you at home uh, joining us tonight and we'll see mm -hmm. you next tuesday night thanks for being here sounds good see everyone see ya